Jesse, hi, and uh, thank you very much for joining me for this edition of the COVID tonic, as I call it. Um, but before we talk about uh, the coronavirus and its effect on uh, society at large, I thought um, I would ask you to, uh, what do you make of some of the statements that I have uh, recently discovered on the internet, such as, for example, that the earth is healing us, uh, sorry, the earth is healing, we are the virus, uh, nature is sending us a message, or from the point of view of mother nature, coronavirus makes everything better. So where do you think these ideas come from and, and what message do you think that Earth is sending us? Humans uh, since ever have felt uh, guilt uh, as well as pride in their actions uh, on the planet of which we are a part. And uh, in uh, moments uh, when things are going well. We, we uh, celebrate uh, the beauty of our achievements. Uh, uh, these can be, the, could be the beauty of gardens, the beauty of families, uh, uh, the beauty of structures, of art, of music. Uh, and in uh, hard times and sad times, uh, 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 I think we ascribe to nature feelings which nature per se doesn't have finally. Uh, you know, I think uh, earthquakes don't know uh, whether there are uh, humans or cats or dogs or trees. Uh, in fact, earthquakes and volcanoes occur on, on other uh, planetary bodies uh, where there's no life. So I would say uh, in the large, uh, 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 nature is immensely indifferent, uh, including uh, the other parts of living nature. Uh, uh, nevertheless, I think it's an important, uh, these feelings are an important uh, manifestation of some things we should take seriously, uh, of, of uh, human arrogance, for example, uh, that uh, I think people thought we had uh, uh, subjugated uh, the microbial world and infectious disease. Uh, that's a theme we may want to come back to. Uh, the hidden majority, the small world, uh, is actually the big world uh, on the planet. And uh, it has its own uh, dynamics of evolution, its own uh, purposes, uh, which are uh, uh, different from those of, of uh, humanity. Uh, humans tend to think that uh, there's a kind of linear trajectory of uh, of progress uh, the of life from the the simplest organisms to multicellular organisms to more complex multicellular organisms uh, to uh, to hominids uh, to humans with language and with uh, science and so forth uh, and the microbial world uh, existed before us, and I think most most people don't think uh, humanity will exist, let's say, uh, a billion years from now. But obviously, uh, there's a very good chance that the microbial world will still exist. So it may be evolving uh, in its own ways, uh, uh, which have, uh, uh, which are c quite separate from or uh, uh, not part of this sort of master narrative that uh, humanity uh, tends to impose on on life on the planet. And uh, it's a master narrative that comes both uh, uh, from a variety of uh, cultural points of, of view. Uh, I wouldn't assign it only to to uh, to uh, one one uh, political viewpoint. No, no, definitely not. Um, although we've been here before, um, I, I do recall some statements during the HIV crisis with people saying things like HIV AIDS is a necessary solution to the environmental degradation of the earth. Um, there was a New York Times uh, columnist who wondered if Ebola and Marburg, uh, Marburg uh, where the biosphere's reaction uh, to the human parasite. And so it just seems to me that there is an underlying subtone of misanthropy here. Um, yeah. Yes, yes. Well, I think this is, a, it, I think you're right that there, there is, uh, it is associated with a general guilt and shame about the 
the uh, some of the the negative effects of uh, of the the growth and spread of the of the human species. Uh, at the same time, I would say it's it is a demonstration that numbers matter. Well, you know, when there are seven to eight billion humans, we are a wonderful target for other species. We are food for the viruses and uh, 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 other other. Uh, uh, potentially for other uh, microbes and so forth, uh, and uh, you know, we, from that point of view, uh, you, know, you know, it's uh, we've become like like rice or potatoes or or wheat. I mean, we are plent so plentiful that uh, if your microbes that want to go forth and and multiply, uh, humans are a very tempting target. Much better, let's say, than uh, uh, sparse. Uh, uh, sperm whales, or or uh, or uh, uh, any species uh, uh, of which the the biomass uh, is very small or uh, highly localized, since you know we're we're uh, you know we're in many places on the planet, and uh, there are lots of us. There aren't that many other uh, species, uh, large species, mammals, and so forth, uh, of which there are billions like this. Uh, the uh, uh, of animal species. Uh, there are a few bird species uh, of which there are uh, hundreds of millions or uh, perhaps uh, a billion. But the, uh, but uh, so, you know, in that sense, we, we have uh, uh, made ourselves a tempting target by being so numerous. And within the, the seven to eight billion, of course, we've also uh, sheltered a, a growing subpopulation of people who are uh, elderly, and frail, uh, and the success of our uh, of of uh, modern medicine and prosperity and so forth that we can uh, sustain many people who in uh, earlier earlier human societies would not have been able to live because uh, 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 again they 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 didn't have the physical uh, strength or the wherewithal. Uh, uh, you know, we we now have uh, 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 a you know a, a large population in in the U.S. alone. I, the number of people in assisted care communities and nursing homes exceeds two million, and of course, many of those people have uh, hypertension, heart problems, diabetes, obesity, uh, other other problems, and so again, that's a uh, the the existence of a uh, of a large population like that, uh, that doesn't have a strong, probably doesn't have a uh, strong immune system, doesn't have uh, the much physical strength to uh, to fight back against the uh, the microbial invaders, uh, means that uh, again, it's a we become a, a a tempting target. So that's very interesting because essentially what it means is that there is nothing special about our relationship with viruses or superbacteria. It's a question of them searching for food and place to eat and to reproduce and to survive. Yes, that's exactly right, Marion, and that's part of the reason uh, the the uh, bird flus have had such enormous, uh, I'll say, success from the point of view of the uh, of the the flus in recent decades. You know, we, we, the 21st century may be remembered as the century of the chicken or the century of poultry. Uh, uh, until now, in fact, other forms of meat, uh, uh, beef and pork, were enormously popular. But in the last 20, 30 years, around the world. Uh, uh, it's not just buffalo chicken wings uh, or uh, chicken nuggets and chicken tenders. Uh, there, are the the population of uh, uh, captive avian species, uh, primarily chickens of various kinds, uh, that uh, uh, humanity now uh, cultivates for its own diet. Uh, again, makes uh, these hundreds of millions or billions of uh, of birds also make a, a tempting. Uh, target. So, if you know, if you're in, again, if you're in a society uh, uh, in which uh, there are only a small number of uh, of such animals, uh, uh, the, the the viruses may still attack them, but they're the chance to to spread uh, 
is going to be much smaller. So in that sense, our our success, our lifestyles uh, 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 do invoke uh, uh, temptation from the uh, the microbial world, which is always there and always the you know again I'd say it's always the hidden majority in the oceans. If if one could. Uh, drain the oceans to learn the total weight of uh, of living matter of biomass in the oceans. Ninety percent by weight of all living matter in the oceans would be the small stuff, the, the microbes, the bacteria and viruses and so forth. Only ten percent would be the fish and the lobsters and the whales. So, uh, it, you know, the 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 world, uh, it, you know, we we. we we tend to think about the world that we see, the world of plants and animals. Uh, but uh, you know, as microbiologists have known for well, since since the invention of microscopes uh, uh, three or four hundred years ago in the Netherlands and elsewhere, uh, and certainly since uh, let's say uh, uh, the late nineteenth century, early twentieth century, and the really the uh, the discovery of again of bacteria and. Uh, uh, the, uh, and the the small world, uh, we've understood that it's everywhere, and it really is. It's uh, it's uh, uh, you know there there are uh, uh, microbes on the uh, living uh, on the biofilms in the sur on the surfaces of the keyboard of your laptop or on the surface of the uh, the steering wheel of your car, uh, as well as inside your mouth and uh, uh, in the carpet. Uh, yeah. Under your feet, and uh, this microbial world is is uh, is everywhere, and of course, it has been since the beginning. I mean, that life began that way. Yeah, yeah. I I, uh, I will be talking to Steven Pinker later about the fact that human progress is not linear. It, the, the the line of human progress is a very jagged one, in a sense that there are uh, declines, uh, even though the general generally speaking, we are we are better off. But the the reason why I bring it up is because I think that um, uh, people tend to think that, you know, the, the world there uh, is under control, that uh, uh, humans have much more power over our surroundings than, than we really do. Um, and people tend to forget that natural evolution goes on at this microbial level and tries to break down uh, whatever barriers, uh, whatever protections we build around humanity to keep those pathogens out. Um, uh, but since you started talking about chickens and uh, food that uh, humanity uh, devours, um, the other strand of the attack or criticism of modernity uh, and, and what is happening vis-a-vis -vis the emergence of COVID uh, comes from people who uh, believe that there is a connection between animal farms and, uh, if not COVID, then certainly uh, other pathogens that could come and cause a lot of damage. Uh, so, uh, again, although I haven't seen uh, any evidence of, uh, uh, of connection between um, animal farms and COVID, how worried should we be about uh, animal farming and pathogens moving forward? Your excellent question raises several issues, and let me begin with uh, the education of immune systems, of the human immune system in this case. Uh, one of the most fascinating developments of the last uh, two or three decades uh, surrounds an idea called the hygiene hypothesis, uh, which is that we are perhaps raising uh, small humans, uh, babies, children, in environments that are so hygienic, which in which we uh, 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 try to uh, uh, reduce the presence of the natural microbial world so much that uh, the immune systems that uh, we grow up with uh, are less educated, less sophisticated, less strong than they were in earlier times. And that may be the reason that in many societies now, the developed societies, we see more uh, allergies, allergenic responses, uh, more asthma. There have been very interesting comparisons, for example, in the US of, uh, of the uh, uh, of, uh, uh, different uh, the lifestyles of uh, different communities. For example, the, the Amish in Pennsylvania 
and so-called Hutterite groups, uh, and uh, that still farm in traditional ways. Uh, the societies that allow the children to play in the mud and allow uh, families to have cats and dogs inside, uh, those, those, fa those families have much lower uh, prevalence of uh, allergies and asthma in among adults than the societies that are extremely hygienic and exclude uh, uh, animals from from homes. Uh, the there have also been Finnish studies about this, uh, showing that uh, I think finally to oversimplify, uh, if you grow up with a dog or two and a cat in your household, you are less likely to have allergies as an adult than if not. So. Uh, just as in many things in life, uh, you need to test yourself a bit to 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 uh, grow strong. Uh, it may be that uh, uh, young that the immune system actually needs, in some sense, to be uh, uh, tested and educated. So, so I would say the separation of humans uh, uh, from from uh, uh, from animals is actually could actually be. Uh, uh, part of the reason we have the the uh, uh, the problem we now do. Uh, at the same time, it's also true that the 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 growth of uh, of uh, agriculture to a very large scale of animal agriculture to produce uh, cattle and pigs and and uh, uh, poultry and so forth again has created tempting targets uh, for the microbial world. We try to reduce those through good ventilation in in the barns, uh, through use of antibiotics in some cases, um, and those again have uh, enabled us to produce unprecedented uh, amounts of food. But this small world of which I've spoken is always looking for openings and opportunities, uh, and uh, 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 it will find it. Uh, uh, and this is one of the reasons, of course, for the tremendous interest now in so-called cellular agriculture. Uh, we may be able to grow meat without growing the animal, so to say. Uh, you know, all the, the, the bone and cartilage uh, is, in some sense, a waste uh, 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 anyway. So if one could uh, go beyond meat to, uh, uh, to just to grow uh, tissue, uh, it may be that uh, that would be much less subject to uh, some of the the uh, the kinds of of uh, uh, of problems we now see. Another aspect of this, of course, is uh, the the uh, the the threat, the uh, the disruptions to the food supply that mischievous or bad people could uh, uh, could achieve through uh, through using. Uh, uh, infectious agents to sabotage uh, uh, farms and and uh, uh, meat production. So uh, the uh, you know it, it's it's a it's a big question as to there there are important big questions about how uh, humanity might wish to encourage the evolution of agriculture uh, uh, and uh, food supply. And I don't think anyone would say the system. Uh, that uh, we have just now is is optimal. Uh, so there are certainly ways to make it more efficient uh, uh, and safer uh, uh, from the point of view uh, of pests. But I would come back to the idea that uh, animals, uh, fundamentally other animals, are good for us. Uh, and if we actually lived in a world, uh, when we live in a, wor uh, uh, in a, in a world in which uh, we have no contact with, uh, with, uh, with, with, uh, well, let's say with birds or goats or whatever it may be, uh, we may actually be uh, uh, increasing our own uh, peril. Mm, that's very interesting. I, I was really fascinated by what you said about molecular agri agriculture and the move toward um, um, creating and, and selling of tissue only. I'm, I'm, I'm a huge fan of that. But I, I think um, there is uh, one question that emerged from your last answer. Um, uh, but because it seems to me that there is a contradiction in some of the COVID commentary. Um, there are some people who claim that happiness, happiness rests in humans being deeply embedded in nature, being as close to nature as possible, growing your own food, that sort of thing, that sort of very romantic view 
of uh, human interaction uh, with the natural world. Um, um, but for some reason, it seems that it's the same demographic of people who want to be close to nature, who presume that they would be exposed to fewer pathogens than if they live in the cities. Um, so how does it work? Uh, what do you think goes on there? Cities are, are a blessing from the point of view of the rest of nature in that they concentrate uh, humans and the impact of uh, impacts of, uh, of, of humans. They leave landscape, uh, uh, water uh, for, for uh, other species. So uh, in general, cities are benign from urbanization is benign from the point of view of, uh, of the, the rest of nature. Uh, and uh, humans, uh, again, as I've s suggested, tend to, you know, we, we're still sort of cave people. Uh, we only spend about an, one hour each day outside, whether we live in the suburbs uh, or, or a rural area or an apartment in Manhattan where I live. Uh, people spend, let's say, an hour, an hour and a half each day uh, roaming around, actually exposed to uh, the sunlight and the, the wolves or the, the, uh, uh, the hazards of city life. Uh, the, but in, uh, in that hour, hour and a half, particularly for children, the experience of being with the rest of nature as a child could be extremely important in terms of the education of the immune system. And putting people into a life in a city, especially, again, uh, early childhood, that's like uh, an intensive care unit in a hospital, a so-called sterile uh, environment could be very risky. So somehow we need both. We want most, most of humanity to live in cities in order to leave most of the landscape uh, available for, for, for uh, tigers and gazelles and uh, uh, badgers or whatever animals you're, you're especially fond of. Um, the, uh, uh, and to provide also you know, the, the uh, 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 clean air and so forth. Uh, at the same time, uh, if again, if we create a situation in which uh, humans have no exposure to the microbial world, particularly, uh, then uh, uh, it's very risky. So, so, and this is again why we tend to see why we see some of the, these problems with allergies and asthma in in uh, in inner cities. So, so we would we need somehow to achieve a balance between exposure. This, this, this romantic view of nature, uh, children playing in the mud, uh, we, we need some of that, especially when we're, we're young, uh, for, for our immune systems as well as for inspiration. Uh, but then if every individual wants uh, a hectare of land uh, and some forest to chop down to burn to keep warm in the winter, we know the outcome of that. We've lived through that. Uh, humanities, you know, we we know the cost of that, which is finally uh, deforestation, denuding of the landscape, and in fact the murder of the wildlife that lives uh, uh, in the landscape. So, so we, we we need to modernize, but we need somehow to maintain uh, uh, contact also, uh, and not to uh, not to isolate ourselves so much that we become so fragile, biologically fragile, that uh, again, a virus comes along and wipes us out. Yeah, what do you make of uh, the, the stories um, in the newspapers about uh, the coming, the, uh, 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 what is it, uh, the, the coming de-urbanization of the world, so that people in places like New York are simply gonna get tired uh, of living in big cities and are going to move into the suburbs or into the countryside. Um, do you think there is, that's likely to happen? The CEO of Microsoft made a very interesting statement a few days ago that we've lived through uh, more than two years of technological transformation in only two months already. And by the time uh, COVID is over, it may be that uh, five to 10 years worth of technical transformation has been concentrated in a few months. Several industries, I think, will sectors of human life will really uh, not go back the way they were, and I would include uh, 
education, uh, entertainment, uh, uh, medicine. Uh, the there are several. The obviously with people have learned that uh, uh, telemedicine or uh, Zoom uh, for uh, education, uh, uh, streaming entertainment, uh, that these work. Uh, it's been talked. People have talked about this for decades, but wow! Suddenly, it's working, and people have invested in the capital and the software uh, to to make it work. Uh, shopping, uh, banking. Uh, apparently, forty percent of the mortgages now granted in the Netherlands are granted online without con direct contact with uh, with uh, a banker going to a, a a bank. So, so there'll be a a range of industries which ratchet in a certain direction towards uh, towards more use of telepresence and autonomy. Uh, uh, however, I don't. It's not clear to me that all those people uh, who are doing these things will uh, uh, choose to live in in rural areas or the suburbs. But we may want more square feet or a, a different allocation of square feet. I live in a small apartment in in Manhattan. And if I'm going to have to have to or choose to work more from home, I would love to have a dedicated home office uh, using my bedroom both as the bedroom and as the office. It's not it, I'd rather go further than six feet from my bed to my office. Uh, so I think a lot may depend really on uh, space. And in the short term, I think people are finding in America that this old fashioned suburban vision of the 1950s and 60s, where people had uh, a more spacious uh, uh, home is attractive if you really are doing remote work. Uh, at the same time, um, uh, again, how you set up uh, you know there are there are problems if you know if uh, if the husband is working in the basement and the and the wife is working uh, at the at the dining room table and there are two children upstairs uh, each in a bedroom trying to do schooling uh, that you know that may not turn out to be an ideal social arrangement uh, also from the the work involved you know the the there are uh, it means three meals a day need to be prepared seven days a week uh, the uh, uh, you, again, you need to have more bandwidth, more laptops, more monitors. Uh, uh, the uh, so it may turn out that after this uh, epidemic is over, that people say, "Wow, it's good we survived," but really, it's good to be at the office or at school at least a good chunk of the time. It's good to have the option of working at home on Fridays or working at home if you're not feeling well. Uh, or if the weather's terrible, uh, but I think a, a lot of people, uh, you know, I, I think the uh, for many things this, the pendulum will swing uh, back in the direction of uh, of contact. Uh, so I'm inclined to think uh, that the uh, that uh, 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 cities will survive. However, we may really have overbuilt uh, commercial real estate. Uh, 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 over the the last few years, uh, so there may be many uh, enterprises that feel uh, they can shrink their footprint, uh, their commercial footprint. Even as I was saying, I you know I would like to have another room in my apartment if I'm going to have to work more from home. So it may be a kind of reallocation, and some of the residential space over time will become well, the commercial space will become. Uh, 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 residential. Uh, but uh, uh, I don't think, uh, uh, and then there's the whole question of the distribution of goods, uh, you know, which has the, the whole question of uh, whether having massive uh, centers that then, and that you then have, you know, drones deliver whatever, you know, deliver a pizza to the, the Tupi household, uh, you know, we haven't yet thought through the the uh, economic, social, and environmental consequences of that. How much energy it will demand, uh, the the questions of packaging and uh, uh, refuse and 
Uh, so there are, I think there are, it's, there are a lot of uh, open questions. But I, I do think that this, this has accelerated uh, the arrival of a set of uh, challenges to a number of, of major industries. Let's change tack a little bit and um, talk about uh, uh, the, the pandemic itself. How serious is it? Um, how do you see it uh, playing out in terms of its overall death rate? And uh, perhaps more importantly, what do you think of the government's response to it? So, um, yeah, uh, how is the death rate coming along and uh, what do you think of the government? Well, you're right to ask about the death rate and in particular about so-called excess deaths. Uh, at any time, uh, each day in every society, a certain number of people are, are uh, passing away. A few more, let's say, in the winter than in the summer. Uh, historically, there were always sort of waves uh, in this regard. But let's say at any given, uh, this, let's say uh, in a typical society, uh, to imagine, uh, imaginary society, let's say 100 people are, are dying each day. The best way to think about a, uh, an epidemic, a lethal epidemic like this one, is to ask how many people each day in addition are, are dying. Uh, is it five? Is it 30? Is it 50? And if you look at the, the wave, that wave of excess deaths, uh, that really is the the essence of the the uh, the uh, epidemic and, or pandemic when it's global like this, and uh, that that's that's a, a number which can be pretty pretty well measured. Uh, now, the you, there's a lot of debate about whether some death you do you assign a death to hypertension or do you assign a death to to uh, COVID or uh, to dementia, but it seems to me in a situation like this, it's as a first order approximation, it's fair to assign all the excess deaths over, let's say the 100 each day that you expect to, to COVID. Now, you may even assign a few more because COVID is uh, reducing the number of auto accidents because people aren't out and about, and it may be reducing uh, other some other uh, causes of death because people are staying home and being more careful. But let's just say that we take the excess deaths as the the basic number. Uh, the uh, for what's happened so far in Europe, which has uh, good statistics about excess deaths, and one can compare it to uh, past periods of excess deaths from flus or other causes. Uh, it looks to me like uh, COVID is, uh, let's say, two to three times as large as uh, uh, other kinds of uh, uh, bad experiences uh, uh, of this genre during the last, uh, let's say, uh, 30, 40 years. Uh, so COVID is certainly a serious uh, 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 epidemic from from that point of view. It's a curious one because it came late. Usually December, January is the time. And of course, it was that was the time uh, it ravaged uh, Wuhan itself. But it reached uh, Europe in the late winter and it really reached America in the very late winter and spring. So that's a, a uh, so I think the that timing is is uh, unusual. Uh, uh, as well. Uh, if then the big question is whether there'll be further waves, second waves, the great 1918-1919 flu pandemic, there was a big wave, it subsided, and then there was an even larger one. Now that took uh, 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 40 to 50 million lives, uh, maybe even more, uh, uh, at a time when the planet's human population was about a what about a quarter of today's population, so it was a really enormous spike. Uh, COVID so far may have taken I'll, I'll give a round number. Let's say uh, on the generous side, uh, three hundred thousand uh, excess deaths, something like that. So that compared to, that's large compared to what's happened in recent decades, but small compared to. 1918, 1919, or the famous uh, 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 Black Death of the 14th century, or the Great Plagues in Northern Italy and Milan in 1630. Uh, so I would say big by modern standards, 
big in light of, again, our confidence or arrogance about uh, our ability to uh, uh, treat, but uh, not on the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the truly uh, 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 scary scale. The famous Latin word decimate means to take a tenth of the population. And so a terrible war or plague in Roman times for the thousand years of the Roman Empire would uh, take 10% uh, of the population or at least 10% of the male population. And, uh, you know, even, even if uh, uh, there's a second wave and it's worse than the first wave, maybe we'll end up, let's say, at a million out of uh, 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 seven and a half billion. So compared to... Uh, those, uh, just in the biological sense, not so great. On the other hand, the economic consequences and financial and social consequences are, uh, you know, it's, this is the greatest disruption uh, in, uh, you know, it's, in that sense, I think it's on the scale of the, the world wars or other enormous uh, uh, disruptions. Which brings me to the obvious uh, question, and I want to be uh, respectful of your time, so I'll, I'll uh, make it the last one. Um, question being, what do you make of different governments' uh, response to uh, the COVID crisis? I mean, clearly, even in Europe, uh, the data that you are talking about, we see some governments with uh, tremendously low COVID death rates, and we see some governments with uh, much higher COVID death rates. I mean, on the low end, we see Greece, surprisingly, uh, places like the Czech Republic, Poland, Slovakia, and so on. On the high end, we see countries like uh, uh, Spain and United Kingdom and, um, uh, and, and France. So what do you make of the different uh, response to it? And tied into it uh, is a sort of a sub-question, which is, it, was Sweden right when it opted for herd immunity, because if there is a second wave, let's say in the autumn, then the Swedes will be able to carry on their normal lives, whereas countries which have been actually very uh, successful in shutting down will be exposed to uh, corona again. First, let me speak to the global r response. You'll, you'll be talking later in the series with Steven Pinker, the author of the very great and important book, uh, Better Angels of Our Nature, about the increasing kindness and gentleness, really, of uh, uh, hu human history on average over the last uh, few thousand years. And the first thing that strikes me about COVID is I, it's amazing to me beautiful uh, that uh, humanity has responded to this threat, which is above all a threat to the elderly population and people uh, who are fragile and frail, by a willingness to largely shut down the societies uh, in order to, uh, to protect a small vulnerable fraction. So I'd say the first the first thing I'd say about the, the global response is that it's uh, uh, a kind of uh, triumph of, uh, of, uh, of altruism. Uh, the, the, you know, the sort of the economists have not ruled. Uh, the, uh, it's really been, uh, a, a, I'd say it's been a very uh, 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 kind of uh, uh, religious, spiritual, uh, moral uh, uh response, which is fascinating and important. And I just wonder, uh, you need to ask Professor Pinker, but I wonder whether one could have expected this kind of response uh, uh, earlier or whether uh, it's, uh, uh, I, 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 you know, before the Weather Channel, we didn't know about uh, really uh, all about hurricanes. Uh, and now, uh, the Weather Channel and its counterparts has made us much more conscious of severe storms, uh, and we're trying to prepare for them. We also think, in some sense, we're more sensitive to them because of the uh, the extensive coverage. Whereas, you know, in, until 1980, even it was hard to know if there was a severe storm uh, 
in parts of the Caribbean or a typhoon in East Asia and before we had satellites and so forth. So it's, it's uh, made us so much more conscious. And I, I feel like in a certain way, the, uh, all of the data about uh, cases, public health, all of these, uh, the real-time epidemiology, uh, it's like the Weather Channel. This is the first real-time epidemic. We had rehearsals with Ebola and uh, the earlier SARS and so forth, but this is the first one where it's, you know, you can really follow it uh, on, your, on your cell phone uh, or computer uh, hour by hour. And so I'm fascinated and wonder whether there's some kind of feedback operating here, which is, which is changing or affecting uh, the behavior of societies. The fact that we can see the people dying in that sense and, and respond. Uh, so, so first I'd say the global response is, is uh, in, to me at least, surprising and uh, impressive. That said, you're at, you asked also about the the competence of governments, uh, and I, uh, you know, the outcomes don't seem very different. So, as a scientist, I'm a natural scientist, not a social scientist, but I would say some countries like uh, uh, Italy and the UK have national health. Uh, 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 Italy has a kind of technocratic government with Conti. Uh, Britain has a right-of-center government uh, with Johnson. France has a left-of-center government with Macron. Uh, the U.S. has a populist government. The outcomes in all the large countries is rather similar. Germany has done better in terms of fatalities, but not so different in terms of cases. Russia, which uh, is, a, I'll say, a monarchy, now has an enormous uh, 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 number of cases. So I would say in the big countries, I don't think the, the, the kind or style of government has made much difference, whether it's left, right, or center, whether it's uh, democratic, small d, or monarchic or tyrannical. Um, how, the small countries, though, seem to have done better uh, in terms of the uh, management. So countries like Austria, uh, Czech Republic, uh, perhaps Taiwan, um, uh, so it's that there may be something to look at there about what unit is actually good for public health. Is it really good to try to manage the public health of 60 or 80 or 300 million or 1.4 billion people? So at least in the developed countries, it seems to me the division is not. It's you. It's you don't get mu learn much by looking at the different politics of the big countries. You learn, but the some of the small countries. Uh, have done much better. Even Portugal, which is not held up as a paragon of uh, of good politics, uh, the uh, the outcomes uh, don't seem that different in Europe. Now, uh, the the outcome with regard to fatalities is different. In so the number of fatalities in Norway, Austria, uh, uh, some of the countries is very low. Uh, it's uh, Sweden and Switzerland, which are two of the wealthiest societies in the world, uh, have intermediate uh, fatalities. Uh, uh, Britain, Belgium, Belgium is the highest, I think. Uh, 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 Italy, Spain are high. Uh, the U.S. is intermediate also. Normally, one would think that, uh, that again, that uh, Sweden and Switzerland would be better than uh, Greece or Portugal, but they haven't been so far. So, uh, so uh, again, it's hard to... It's early to say, but I, I don't think it's I don't think it's politics, and I don't think it's wealth. Uh, at the same time, uh, the uh, 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 I think you ra you also raise the important issue of uh, sort of strongly defensive strategy versus the more uh, adventurous strategy of Sweden, Belarus, and perhaps a few other countries. Again, as a scientist, I'm glad that let's say the 190 countries of the world have not followed identical strategies because the way we learn is by observing the differences. So I think it's extremely valuable that uh, Sweden, uh, Belarus, and some other countries, uh, Czech Republic to some extent, have had the, the uh, have been willing to, uh, to try different policies so we can see the, the social experiments. We don't know the outcome yet. Uh, if there's a second, we don't know whether there'll be a second wave. Uh, we don't know, uh, uh, we still don't really know whether the herd immunity comes, let's say, with uh, 
uh, as low as, let's say, uh, 45 or 50 percent of the population, which some of the Swedish research suggests, or whether one really needs to get to, uh, uh, to 90. Uh, and it may turn out to be other matters. Uh, Russia is interesting. Russia is reporting very few fatalities. It could be because there are very few males over the age of 60 or 65 in Russia, because Russia has low life expectancy, especially for males. 60 percent of COVID deaths are male. So it may be that the well, there are a lot of that there could be an enormous amount of illness in Russia, but less fatality because the people who are getting sick are simply younger and more able to respond. Uh, in Sweden, a large fraction, I think half the deaths in Sweden are at uh, 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 assisted care and nursing facilities in Stockholm. Uh, one would have to check that, but it's it's a big big fraction. So this comes back to the in California, half the, the losses are in assisted care and uh, nursing homes. In Massachusetts, 60 percent. Uh, in the state of Rhode Island, 70 percent of uh, fatalities are in assisted care and nursing homes. So uh, it could be that, again, in terms of loss of life, the real issue turns out to be how well or badly are we managing uh, those uh, facilities. Uh, so it may be that somehow in in uh, in uh, uh, the the elder population, I don't know. Maybe in Greece and Portugal, the older population is still living more on its own or with families, not concentrated together. Uh, so there's a lot still to learn. But I'd say overall, looking around the world, there's no. It's not as if there's a country that has that appears to have the magic formula. Yeah, yeah. No, I accept that, and I, I, I'm, I think you're absolutely spot on that the fact that not all the countries have gone in the same direction will give us very valuable information. Uh, but would it be fair to say that um, if the second wave comes, if it comes, let's hope it doesn't, but if it comes, and some countries are further along in developing herd immunity, then deaths at that point amongst the elderly will be smaller than in countries which haven't developed herd immunity. Would, would, would that be a fair assumption or at least would that be something to look out for? I'd say, you know, it depends so much on the emergency medicine in hospitals and uh, also treatment. I'm personally not too optimistic about a vaccine having waited 30 years for an HIV vaccine uh, 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 you know, the, since more than 30 years since people started uh, looking for that and, and uh, it still doesn't exist. Um, on the other hand, uh, I, I think the treatments, the chemical cocktails uh, could come along uh, by the autumn around the time or before the time of a second wave. Uh, I, I, you know, the, 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 you know, what really, again, uh, the, the search for uh, uh, an HIV vaccine continues and I, I hope uh, it's found, but the real success with HIV was uh, the work of Dr. David Ho and others uh, with the chemical cocktails, which became available in the mid 1990s. Uh, yeah, you know, a generation before the vaccine. So, I, I would say, you know, the, the uh, I think the the uh, the real uh, protection for the elderly and the vulnerable. Uh, is more likely to come from from uh, treatment. Uh, I mean, you're also, you know, it's not so clear that giving a vaccine to somebody who's, let's say, 90 years old, uh, it's just not so clear what will happen. So this thing is so complex. I'm, I'm just absolutely amazed. It's uh, coming back to your earliest questions. I, I think it's an incredible mirror that we are holding up to our societies. So, uh, you know, if you think of society overall as a learning system, uh, you know, I, I would go beyond what uh, the CEO of Microsoft said about learning, you know, just using Wo Zoom and these kinds of things. You know, the, I mean, who would have thought that the Supreme Court in, of the United States would use Zoom? Or I'll just say it doesn't have to be the Zoom technology. It could be any of the others. It could be Skype or WebEx or GoToMeeting or BlueJeans. doesn't matter. But that happened, I'll say, probably 10 or 20 years earlier than it otherwise would have happened. And I think the, I would say in closing uh, for, for your excellent uh, 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 set of activities, uh, 
uh, I, I would say the 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 biggest benefit of uh, of uh, this pandemic uh, may turn out to be an an enormous acceleration of social learning in a whole range of uh, domains of of uh, human activity, including public health, but but in many others as well. Well, Jesse, I, I, I promised I would keep you for 30 minutes. I kept you for 50. I apologize. But I, I uh, as always, I learn a great deal from you and hopefully our viewers uh, will too. And uh, if um, uh, this video series takes off, then who knows, maybe uh, we can do this again and talk about your real passion, which is oceans. And <laughs> we're still counting fish. We're still counting fish. Very okay, good. Marion, it's always a pleasure, to, I'll Sorry. say, to have your company in person or remotely. Thank you very much. Much appreciated and uh, have a good afternoon. You bye -bye. too. Bye-bye.